Hello back, sorry I messed up earlier, presented another talk. Today instead we'll be talking about, right now, practical security in the brave new Kubernetes world uh, with Alex Ifkin, who's a director of solutions at Eclipsian, a US security company. He, his focus is on secure deployment of insecure or secure software, uh, including container orchestration, application security, and firmware security. Alex has two decades of security integration experience presented at numerous security conferences, delivered training, hold a master in computer science, co-authors the Isaka CSXP certification, and climbed mountains in his spare time. So give a good round of applause to Alex. Thank you. Thank you. I can, I can hear all those applause, right? Yay. <laughs> Thank you for joining. I'm excited to be here. It's, it's really uh, a great thing to be here. And I'm going to start switching into the presentation right now so everybody can actually see the presentation instead of my uh, six screens in the back. Now, um, you should be able to see that right now we start the presentation. So, thank you very much. As uh, I'm sure um, many of you have seen before, a lot of presentations in uh, Kubernetes world start with a nautical theme, so I'm no different. I'm actually going to put on my uh, my pirate hat. You, you don't see it today right now, but I'll, you'll see it later. There, there, there. So I, 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 I'm not going to talk all in pirate speak, but at least I'm going to have my hat. All right. So if you've ever been feeling overwhelmed or if you've uh, started looking at the new cool technologies that are coming from the DevOps world and started thinking that, hey, they're building so much rapid stuff so quick and there's many, many new technologies coming on board that I just, you know, feel that I'm not following, not coming through, not understanding them enough. Well, it's true. Yes, they're building it and they're building it really, really fast. And the question in everybody's minds who's doing the security is, is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Well, how do I start thinking about all the new cool technologies that are, my developers are picking up? And I'm here to tell you that it's not all that bad. There's actually really good things about it. There's some bad things about it. This presentation is about the details of what it means to be running DevOps and Kubernetes and adopting the developer mindset. So. There I am, Alex Sivkin. I come from uh, the land of the trees from Portland, Oregon. You heard all about me and we're gonna start. The modern application stack, if you think about it, doesn't consist of the usual platforms that you used to. What it does uh, in, consist of is platform in the back, you know, that server that is actually running some, some serverless components on it that also has an OS and the kernel on top of it. And then there starts the container ecosystem, the runtime, an orchestrator that puts all those containers together, and then finally the application. So in this talk, I'm not going to talk about the two lower pieces, even though I actually work with the, the lower level of security. They're outside of this. We're going to focus on application orchestrator and container. So everybody heard about containers. Some of you have been trying playing, even maybe hacking containers. And the question, the first question that everybody has is, can containers help with my security? And the answer is yes. Yeah, yeah, if you build them and deploy them and run them properly. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, where they help is persistence. Containers, you can wipe them off, so it makes harder to persist in a specific container. It's harder to do uh, tooling or leaving off the land. There's just not enough tools in an average container for you to do nefarious activities or for somebody else to do it. Uh, things like path traversal, obviously, are limited. Resource consumption, if you run it correctly. So there's certain things that containers do well. Now, if your app is bad, the container will never fix it. So if you've got any of the issues that your app has been suffering before you've put it into a container, it's still going to suffer from those. And, you know, in injections and security utilization, runtime exploits, all the out-of-bound errors and the references and work overflows and workarounds and time of use, time of check, all those fun stuff is still going to be there, still going to be crashing your app and making it easier to abuse. And more importantly, uh, things like cross-side request forgery or even server-side request forgery become even more important, but because now you're uh, with those, you get an insight into 
not just the application, but the container that it's running on and the orchestrator that it's on. And containers also add their additional issues with software supply chain. And I'll cover that in a bit. So, all right, containers out. We've talked about them. There's plenty of presentation to talk about security of containers and what's good, what's bad about them. Good summary. Now, how do you ship your containers? You really uh, don't deliver your application in one single container. It just doesn't make sense. That The whole idea about splitting up monolithic apps is you have multiple small components that are independent of each other. So you ship it with something. And there's all good friends of ours that we've been um, seen in the past and tried and true and have experience with that provides declarative deployments where you tell what you want and then it figures out how to do it. They've been all good and so, but they also have quite a bit of limitations. So the new kid on the block's been now for several years, Kubernetes, Kubernetes, yay, the, the captain there. And you can see from uh, different reports, Kubernetes has been taking a whole precedence over other types of orchestrators on the market. It's it's a clear majority. Everybody's taking on it. Everybody's trying to use it, trying to understand it, trying to hack it. So what's good about it and where does it help? Well, um, it does help some help with security and helps natively with security. The biggest thing that it helps with is it allows your containers to live very short lifespans, meaning that if you deploy your microservices that only need to run for less than 10 seconds, you do it with orchestrators. And that kills attempts to abuse that specific container within 10 seconds. So your exposure is, is really limited. And likewise, you have a bunch of containers that are mixing and mashing and living on different nodes, flipping servers. So your persistence becomes a headache um, if you're a red teamer. That's good. What's bad? Well, I said, can they help with security? Yes, if you know what you're doing. And that if is the biggest if I've seen in my security career. The things that I've seen working with different cluster installations and Kubernetes deployments is the misunderstanding, the taking of the defaults as if they were secure or Picking the wrong components is what hurts most deployments. So things that I've seen just list them, the, the bad authentication, access controls, security misconfigurations. Uh, people have you know, always had logging monitoring as an author, afterthought and missing on mutual TLS and service accounts and secrets distribution, all that kind of fine stuff. So to understand the extent of that problem and to see how we can deal with that, I wanted to walk you through steps of what it takes to deploy a modern application on the Kubernetes platform. So obviously you can't just throw a bunch of containers in. If you have your pieces of application on the web talking to each other, you need to have some sort of way to talk to them externally. So you have to have an ingress point. And you have to have a service mesh so that they can communicate with each other. Once you got that, you do need to introduce a way of monitoring your performance. If it's a production application, you obviously don't want it to be slow. You don't want it to go down accidentally, or um, you don't want to see um, what kind of issues, errors that it's having and catch them ahead of time. So you need to introduce a metric store, a log store, and tools to monitor those metrics as they're being collected. and monitoring the logs, then you start thinking about it and yeah, you have to have the authorization, you know, that pesky thing that security folks are pushing me to do. And you have to make sure that the API that is being collected is authorized and you're actually making decisions on who to provide data based on authorization, not just pure trust. Then you have to have a network controller because, you know, there's other security folks who are saying, oh, we, we got to control how, who and how talks to our network. And then once you've got all that, you need to think about how do I bring all those containers together and deploy them on my cluster. So you have to have a registry that contains all those various pieces of stuff. And then once you have so many pieces, you have them 
you, you need a way of managing those pieces and deploying them in one swap or upgrading them as a unit instead of trying to upgrade all the little pieces together and getting yourself in the mess. So you need some sort of a package manager for, for those pieces. And if it weren't already too complex, you also need TLS because yes, because encryption. And you also need dashboard to have a look at all this mess and, and have an existential thought of why did I get myself into all this trouble? And the trouble is big. So when you've collected all those components, when you've put it all together, this is the ecosystem. This is literally a screenshot of the cloud native landscape that now exists, that's grown around the Kubernetes ecosystem that provides different pieces of software support and monitoring and management for your application on Kubernetes. It's literally that massive and it's getting bigger and bigger every day. So you can see how many different pieces of software it actually takes to run a fully microservice, fully containerized application in production on Kubernetes. And with that comes security issues. One of the most popular ingress points is still has plenty of those and they're being addressed, but as, as we all know, security needs patching and this batch just happened slowly. Grafana, one of the collectors or um, display tools for Prometheus, which is the very popular metrics collection tool in Kubernetes, they, they both have security issues. And Envoy, the, the most popular, um, maybe since Linkerd, uh, mesh for your Kubernetes pods that has its own issues. This is what I'm showing here is, is very critical components that your Kubernetes system relies on and has a specific uh, interest in keeping secure. So I'll give you an example. Let's say you're making early choices and you wanted to say, well, what is that Kubernetes network plugin that I wanna use in my specific deployment? All is more than eight available. And if you pick not Cilium, not Weave, WeaveNet, which is a commercial, uh, partial commercial application, uh, you're gonna end up with no encryption. So you'll have to flip it at some point later and that would be a big headache. That's uh, easy mistakes to make in the beginning when you're deploying. Now, ingress controllers. All right, so what if, what I do to pick a right ingress controller into my Kubernetes? Well, you can see there's ingress nginx, and I'm not sure if you heard, there's also nginx ingress, and they're completely different. One comes from Intel, uh, from Kubernetes cloud, the other one comes from the nginx crowd. So completely different. You can see they're completely different in terms of how they're handling or how they even thinking about security. Pick one over another and you might end up in a bit of a trouble later on talking to uh, authentication or trying to support JWT tickets or tokens. Similarly for the other ones too, uh, Istio thankfully has been getting some momentum and some support from Google. So it has a bit of a support behind it and a bit of a help in getting that going, but it's still uh, fairly, um, it still needs work to be done. Let me put it this way. Ambassador traffic. And what you see here is actually uh, only six that I picked out of probably 12, 15 different ingress controllers that are available right now for Kubernetes. I have a link at the bottom of that presentation that'll send you to the whole list if you're so inclined. Well, so you thought about this and, and maybe a thought in your head is, well, I, I know those pieces are difficult to pick and maybe I can plan the time around and picking those different components and, and putting them together before I architect it. But the very basic decision that you have to make is the one of how do I run Kubernetes? Do I run it myself on my own bare metal servers or do I run it in the cloud on their servers or do I trust somebody else to run it? Like Google, Amazon, Azure, even DigitalOcean has their own offering. So this is where you run into a trouble too. If you've looked and seen previous presentations about security and the container security, you probably know already by now that Docker is, 
has really good defaults in the beginning so, from security standpoint. So that when you run an application in Docker with defaults, it's going to protect you from a lot of things. And I've listed this here. So Docker D comes with app armor enabled by default. There's a seccom profile that is filtering a lot of calls. There's is blocking 56 calls and that's all good. Now, what you probably didn't know um, is if you run Minikube, uh, which is one of the ways to developers for a developer to run Kubernetes really quickly on their own laptop, so you don't get any of that. You don't get app armor, you don't get sec pro profiles, you don't block any syscalls. So woohoo, that, that means basically you can hose your own system really, really fast. Um, maybe not a big deal. I mean, you, you probably break your system periodically, so you know, whatever. But there are others like K3S that promise more of a production ready deployments. They still don't adopt the good defaults. They're still not filtering in the seccom profiles. They still allow little more than normal syscalls to go through. And to give you an example of what a, a non-block syscall can do, if you don't block unshare, it literally takes one command, unshare-r, inside of a non-privileged container to elevate to root because it'll actually share the root's namespace, the user namespace with you inside the container and then your root. And so your whole, if you're basing your security model in containers on running as non-root users, then your whole security is out of the, blown out of the water just because you didn't block once this call. Now, when you go to cloud providers like GCP or AWS or Azure, you can see them, even though they're not blocking syscalls, as many syscalls as you see on this lower column, what I've actually realized after investigating and playing around with those Kubernetes uh, systems is that they block those syscalls at the node level. They have their own hardened operating systems that are denying those syscalls, not by Kubernetes, but by the OS and kernel themselves. So this is good. Um, what I would call in this sense is that generally your cloud providers are doing better than you would out of the box yourself. All right. Well, so that brings us to, to the most important points. So, man, this is so much crap. There's just a lot of things that are, could go wrong with Kubernetes, and it's a big if in in asking myself if I could actually run and execute all those um, microservices successfully. So what do you do? Well, I'm here to give you several advices, real world practical advices that I've uh, run into and I've done over a couple of years in the past deploying stuff. So a very easy set of steps that you can do to uh, make sure that you actually deploy correctly is to um, focus on getting the images that you don't trust. And essentially, you either start your own images from the beginning, or if you can't, or if your developers don't want to, start your images from a Docker file that you've reconstructed. What that means is that um, you might know that Docker keeps all the Docker history in its list, and you could actually uh, run a tool, and I, I have a link there, uh, the tool that I wrote that allows you to recover the Docker file from an existing image. Once you've recovered that Docker file building and you want as easy as running a Docker build dash F. The reason I'm suggesting it here is that because uh, that Docker history is nothing more than just a set of comments inside of the the Docker uh, contain, uh, Docker tar file itself. Anybody can fake that history. So you could have the history that says, "Oh, I'm just you know deploying this file or copying this file, or maybe I'm running apt-get to get those dependencies." But in fact, your layers inside of your Docker uh, container will contain malicious stuff. So the easiest thing to do is either don't trust those ones that you get off the internet or recover the Docker file, build the image yourself, tag it with your own tags, and at least you know that your supply chain is somewhat better. 
never run privileged containers or share the volumes with the node. That's the easiest way to get yourself own. Privileged containers allow you to deploy things like kernel modules into your host module if you if you know how to share the volumes outside of the container. They're generally a very bad idea. Now, unfortunately, there's not always a way of uh, avoiding this. Like if, for example, even GitLab, when it runs its CDI, CT pipeline, their runner that they are decided to deploy on Kubernetes requires privileged containers. And they, they require it because they want to start other containers from it. And there's really not a good way to start a container within a container without having a privileged container. If you can't avoid doing that, avoid it at all costs. That's the easy way to get owned. The shared volumes, obviously, if you get yourself access to the files that are running on the node itself, then you can change those files and get yourself persistence and hook into the underlying node. Stash all the uh, Kubernetes secrets into uh, all the secrets, uh, your data into Kubernetes secrets. That's really uh, a basic step so you can later ship them out somewhere and encrypt them somewhere and don't keep them in your application. I hope that's fairly simple. Monitor for rogue containers. Now that that should be pretty obvious. The way that people got their systems abused, their Kubernetes clusters abused two, three years ago already was by somebody just figuring out that they had an open API and their open API allowed somebody else to push a command to run a container. And what that does is that uh, Kubernetes or Docker D uh, will go out and download that image and will run it for somebody else. So that's how people had their clusters mining Monero coins for quite some time. And that's still happening. There's still plenty of open API, Docker D APIs and, and Kubernetes APIs out on the internet where somebody will just push containers out to you and, and get you happily producing coins for them, which is arguably not a not a terrible, terrible thing that will happen to you, but it's still nothing you want to have on your cluster. So check the check the clusters from containers periodically. Have a monitoring system. If you're running in the cloud, secure the metadata. I um, cut out the demo out of this presentation, but my demo is essentially going and looking at the cluster and picking up the metadata. And the metadata in the cloud for Kubernetes clusters, it doesn't just contain information about the nodes, it contains information about the cluster itself. You can get the uh, service IDs out of that metadata and then elevate your privilege very easily into what essentially could be your Kubernetes administrator. So if you don't secure your metadata, um, you really run a high risk of somebody elevating privileges to administrators. Uh, running Container Optimized OS, if you're in Google or Bottle Rocket, and if, if you're in AWS, some, some operating system that's more secure than the default, that should be natural to you. That actually takes really little or no effort at just picking the, picking the image that you use during the cloud deployment. On bare metal, you need to run a hardened operating system. Like I showed before, uh, orchestrators themselves, don't necessarily provide you with the same defaults that the Docker does. So you have to protect yourself some other way, somewhere, you know, do this, the uh, defense in depth approach. And uh, unfortunately, uh, you, many of you probably heard that CoreOS is dead. So a uh, flat car is supposed to be its replacement. I haven't tried it. I'm not quite sure what, uh, how, how good it is. Maybe it's good. I haven't tried it. Can't really recommend or not recommend it. But uh, you can always get by by running minimal Debian installation that only has CRI, the, the Docker D or something on it. And the same if you looking to go deeper, have an Alpine that um, is really, really limited to only running containers. And obviously run, use RBAC. Everybody should be doing it. Uh, normal mode. Now, once you pass the easy things that you've done and you feel fairly, um, look at the uh, building images from scratch or use distroless images. Those are really cool. I've been using them for a while, literally no issues with them. I, I really like how they work. 
bot security policies, um, have multiple registries and authenticate authorized access into those registers. Don't, don't keep your production control, um, production mixed in with your development images, obviously, and have developers, you know, accidentally do something not very good for your uh, production infrastructure. Remap root to not root. It's more difficult to use. It breaks stuff, but if you diligence, you can get uh, fairly far enough with it. Obviously, upgrading all the master nodes and the later nodes, Kubernetes iterates quite fast, and they are doing a lot of security improvements, a lot of security fixes to the core of Kubernetes. So please make sure you update. Aim for zero trust. That's more more of an advanced topic. And then the hard mode is if you actually start doing the scans for images. Notice I put it here in the hard mode, not because it's hard to do, but because those tools, in my experience, are incredibly faulty. They're just not really tuned for container, the ways the containers opt uh, operate. And it'll call you, especially uh, software composition analysis, it'll list you hundreds, and if not thousands, of libraries that you never use in the container. And you'll be scratching your head and thinking, why? What I do? So maybe when you get to the hard mode, then start paying attention to those, or wait till they're mature. Uh, pod admission policies, cool things, they really help with your security. If you can sign your images, sign them. That will help tremendously with supply chain for Docker. Unmixed sensitive workloads, uh, here just remember that namespace don't provide what's called a hard multi-tenancy, meaning that you can't separate different data very uh, successfully using namespaces. There's still hooks and crannies that people can get around to jump from one namespace to another. Um, just don't don't mix, uh, if, if you really need multi-tenancy, run multiple containers, don't run namespaces. Final things, uh, there's a plenty of the uh, now information available on the internet where you can go and start digging deeper into the things that I've listed here and understanding what they are and how you can protect the Kubernetes environments. There's a, a decent set now of companies that have sprung up that publish white papers and presentation that are decent. Um, some some better, some worse, but you know, this, you can if you can pick one or two interesting nuggets from their presentation, I think that's good enough. And the final slide I want to leave you here. Uh, it's complex, uh, guys, it's gonna get more and more complex too. There's really not uh, an end in sight in simplifying this. This is gonna have more components built on top of more components. And if you're a really uh, blue teamer, think about keeping complexity in, in tab. Think about limiting the numbers of, let's say ingress controllers, just standardize on one, don't let developers pick whatever they want or you know like i said cnis or cris just limit them they'll make your life a lot easier if you're a red teamer now uh, it's the errors and configuration of kubernetes containers that are going to lead to a lot of breaches it's not uh like you know zero days in your east or in envoy deployments although those are those happen too uh so just look for something that somebody forgot to set, a setting on your access to your secrets. And you know, if you if somebody is doing, let's say, let's encrypt through DNS and they store secrets in uh, for, for accessing the DNS management interface in the container, then you can own the DNS. And what's better than owning a DNS server, right? And for everybody else, Make secure by default. That's the only thing that's gonna really help us in the long term with the Kubernetes becoming so popular. Don't let folks pick in security faults. With that, may your journey be fruitful and happy. And I believe that Kubernetes is here to stay for a long time. We just need to make sure we secure it correctly. Thank you very much. Okay, we're back. Thanks, Alex, for this great talk. Kubernetes is such a good technology and it's like, it's gonna become more and more used. And I like the steps of them easy, normal and advanced. It really helps people in like either starting with their low security and going up all the way. Um, and let's go with the questions. We have one that is voted quite a lot. Do you have any resources for someone who would like to start doing some offensive Kubernetes assessments, like abusing misconfigs or escaping containers? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, uh, there's a there's a system that a, a friend of uh, mine uh, put together uh, called Bust the Cube. Essentially, it's just a Kubernetes cluster that you can download as a set of VMware or um, sorry, VirtualBox VMs that you can deploy and and start playing around it with searching for vulnerability. It's it's like a your own CTF for Kubernetes. There are actually been CTFs too uh, that you can participate in to get a sense of what it takes to investigate. And there's a plenty of tools now available that allow you to automate some of that discovery. I don't quite have a link to where, you know, you'd have something like an awesome Kubernetes own edge, but I will, I'm actually thinking of putting something together. So um, maybe watch my Docker hub Oh, uh, not Docker, um, GitHub. And then I'll see if I can put together those resources in one place. That'd be nice. If you want to add your GitHub account too in the Twitch chat so people can yep. link yep. to it. Mm -hmm. um, okay, second question. What about monitoring the K8 slugs? What are some of the things to look for to detect malicious behavior in your cluster? Um, that's a good question. I right now most of the logs uh, that you know Kibana and everybody is really geared towards error monitoring. If you can get logs from your etcd, then you can monitor for things that are uh, basically that adding new Docker containers, adding uh, or changing configuration on the Kubernetes itself. I guess I, uh, my really short answer is that I'm not entirely sure of any open source tool that would allow you to do it. There's several available there. You know, I don't want to advertise anybody, but there's Aquasec and Twistlock and they all promise to do those things. I frankly have not tried those. I'm just really relying on monitoring the, the SCD myself. Okay. Uh, is there any danger of leaving sensitive data on intermediary built containers? Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> There's yeah, as as you know, uh, containers are built with the layers in mind, and every new layer uh, just uh, just tells what the data is replaced on the previous layer. When you delete a file from an intermediate layer, and I have a whole um actually um. Uh, separate workshop on Docker security. If you're interested, if you go to the GitHub um, Alex, slash Alex Ifkin, there's a, um, a workshop on container security. And this is where I show that if you build something in the middle, it's always there, even if you delete it. And I tell you how you can recover that deleted file by just looking at the internals of how the container is built. So remember, never put anything secret, even at the build time use build args or use environment variables, but don't ever build anything into the image. Would you consider giving that workshop next year at Northside? <laughs> sure, <laughs> absolutely. Let's see. Uh, it's, um, Philip is asking, do you have any recommended tools to assess the security of containers, pods, insecure config version? Uh, there's several there on the market. The um, InGuardian who created the uh, the Bust the Cube uh, training platform also has uh, what they call Pyretes. Uh, that's one of the systems I'm familiar with that basically evaluates the setup, the defaults, the um, internals of your clusters. I, that's the one I have experience with. You can run that, uh, but there's plenty, there's probably five or six more, and I can probably dig up the links for those two that allow you to assess. They're open source, they're fairly. Um, um, Okay, they're not the full coverage, but they they give you a sense of where you stand at least. Okay, like can you share these links or these tools, even though they're yeah. not? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I can share. Cool. Um, can you link to any resources to learn more about containers build history and security? Uh yes, I can. I can do that. <laughs> People. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Please link everything. Um. <laughs> Up to that point, should there be a separation for multi-tenancy? Uh, can, can you say that question again? I don't see it. Sorry, up to that point, should there be separation for multi-tenancy? I'm not sure if I actually understand the question, but let me try to um, mm. address the multi-tenancy. As I said, um, 
Kubernetes namespaces don't provide hard multi-tenancy in the sense that if you have multiple customers or customer data, you really shouldn't be running it on the same cluster. And that's because the controls are not there and it's been proven almost academically that it's not possible to introduce those controls, at least without sacrificing a lot of things. Uh, now for self multi-tenancy, meaning that, hey, uh, I don't have multiple customers, but I have multiple groups on the same Kubernetes clusters and that's okay if it leaks sometimes or it leaks a little bit of a data. Yeah, you can do it. If it's within your organization and you're okay, maybe, you know, trusting somewhat the groups that you have, then yeah, you can you can use namespaces for that. But if you can't Without trust, sacrificing security. Uh, if you adopt a proper threat model, if your threat model says my groups are within decent control and I can trust them not to run malicious stuff knowingly, then yes, you can provide self multi tenancy with namespaces. The opposite situation is if you're running your client's data, which you can't trust at all, then you can't really do it. Okay. Um, between more securization, security, securitization, what, that word, <laughs> and less complexity, which would you prioritize? So securitization and less complexity. Yeah. I, I, repeat? <laughs> I think I understand, but I always prioritize less complexity. It's, okay. It brings more security with it. So uh, if you can establish, uh, be on the meetings where developers are thinking about, you know, points of ingress, egress, the, the storage controllers, et cetera, et cetera, that are putting into the cluster before they make the choice so that you have at least a view into how they're making that choice. Because a lot of times, you know, they're not making that choice because of security, they're making it because of convenience or speed or something like that. Um, and if you can be there and, and participate in making that choice, you will provide them with a valuable service. Okay. And, and hopefully limit the number of choices they make to, to something that's manageable. True. Okay, we have one final question. Uh, what are the weak points of full solutions like Pivotal, PKS? Oh, which one? Pivotal? So, yeah, PKS. Can you read that again? I'm not sure. I would like to, but the person I typed the question, so I can't see you. Can see it again? Give me a second. Um, so the question is, what are the weak points of full solutions like Pivotal, PKS. Uh, pivotal PKS. Yeah, yeah. If if I understand, yeah, pivotal. I, I don't have a, a direct experience with Pivotal, but I've uh, actually worked with, um, there, there's a competitor of there that tries to push PKI on top of everything. The reality is PKI is never a full solution. There's, PKI does decent for authentication, maybe some authorization, uh, obviously the transfer layer encryption, but it doesn't really address the questions of how do I do my end user authentication, how do I uh, provide uh, different controls where if you think about the the zero trust controls, right? Where how do I authenticate the endpoint without trusting um, the endpoint implicitly? So a lot of systems, especially like Istio, if you consider now in Kubernetes provides mutual TLS already out of the box. It's clearly a good component to have, but it's not the only component. It's it's only addressing part of the issue. Okay. Well, I think we're out of time. Uh, thank you very much, Alex. A lot of applause again for giving us a talk. It was really interesting. And uh, we'll be coming up next with the DMA attacks talk in 10 minutes. So everybody can go for a coffee and mate or a date. Nice <laughs>